Hello, everybody. It's Keith. Help support the Northeast scene and declare yourself a member today. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your podcast medium of choice. Rate us and leave a review. Every little bit helps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It has every podcast episode plus other exclusive content. Like and leave a comment. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the NE Scene. Also, continue to write us at northeastscene at gmail.com. We want to share your experiences as well. And now, here's the show. everybody and welcome to the northeast scene podcast this is keith and tommy and we're back again i mean of course and we're excited tonight to bring you new day rising oliver nachinovich and adam brylowski will be joining us from the band tommy new day rising have been inactive since the year 2000 really and now they're back like That's crazy can you imagine an entire lifetime for a person has conceivably existed in the time they've been inactive? Yeah. Yeah, that's fucking 21 years. Yeah. That's fucking, that's a long time. That that, that inactivity can drink legally in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're back. And I'm excited to talk to them because uh, that last CD on eulogy, that was in rotation for me. Memoirs of Cynicism, yeah, 1997. And I remember sending that to you fairly recently, sometime in the last, I don't know, oh, six months. Six months or so, yeah. For yeah, sure. we were tr- trading tracks back and forth. I sent that to you and I saw their back and I'm like, let's do this. So I'm excited to talk to the boys and see, uh, find out more about their history and find out what they did in the 21 years the band was inactive. Yeah, we got to fucking clear this up, too, because they got to get their YouTube presence. Like, fucking, there's another band called New Day Rising. And they put out, because I actually got confused, because I was like, I knew. So do you remember the cover of Memoirs of Cynicism has kind of like a disembodied kind of feel? Like, it has like the... um. Yeah, it's it like a, a gothic green, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a statue's face, and then it's like that green overlay on top. Exactly, right? There's another band that has this like really clean logo that like it's like NDR like overlaid on top of each other. Like each letter flows over top of the other letter. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> they're terror. Whatever this band, this new band. <laughs> Say they they got to sue the shit out of these people because they stink. You also get a lot of hits for the classic album by Husker Du, yes. New Day Rising. Exactly. Yeah, so what? let's see what's going on. Tommy, I had quite a week last week. Now, you know I was sick when we were doing the show last week. Yeah. And I was listening back and I was like, yeah, I sound a little off. I felt a little off. And I just got sicker and sicker throughout the week. Uh, Monday was bad, Tuesday was worse, Wednesday was even worse, and Thursday, I thought I had COVID, honestly, because I was so out of it, I was taking DayQuil, I I was up at 12.30, and I was coughing so bad, I was like, I'm not going to get to sleep unless I drink NyQuil, so I went to the, uh, I went to the bodega at 12.30, bought NyQuil, came back and did a shot, and within half an hour, it was like, boom, out, just out. The amazing thing about these cold medicines is that when you're not on uh, elephant doses of street <laughs> street drugs, they work. <laughs> they work. And I had the craziest dreams. You know what was in my head all night? What? Night will, night will, night will. We love you, you giant fucking Jew. <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear, I heard that in my dreams like all night. And it was just, it was crazy. And then I got up. And I would take DayQuil, and that's like speed. And I, I, I ate my breakfast Thursday morning, and I could not taste it. I could not taste anything. Ugh. And I was like, I was like, I have COVID. I have the Delta variant. So I got so nervous. I went to urgent care, and they give you a COVID test if you're sick. And of course, that came back negative. And the doctor just told me there's this super cold going around. And everybody that I. T- 
like 95% of the people I've talked to up here have gotten it. Oh, wow. It was the worst thing I've ever had. I was bedridden from a cold, and I was like coughing until I was almost passing out. Uh, I had to take the NyQuil to sleep, but I hated it. I didn't like the way it made me feel. But I, w- I was coming back from urgent care, and I was really high on like the day quill. Yeah. And I felt kind of like speedy. And I heard uh, this song on the radio. It was Machine Gun Kelly. It was, uh, he's like one of these little peep, new rapper type guys. Oh, I know who he is. I've seen his face before. Yeah. And he put out like a rock album. But it, oh. so- it sounds like Blink 182. Oh, get out, really? Yeah, the song is called Bloody Valentine. It just sounds like good emo pop punk. I was like, this is amazing. I was vibing to it. But after that day, I stopped taking the day quill because it, it was like a little scary. I didn't want to feel high. Yeah, no, I I, I got the... I, that, that's, a, that's a slippery slope there. <laughs> yeah, because the, the night quill was... Uh, the NyQuil was great. I love it. Like you drink it and you're and you're out within the. Oh uh, yeah, that is a well. Especially the thing is, is like I don't know what the actual dosage is with NyQuil, but like it's the uh, the thing that makes you sleepy in it is the amount of antihistamines because it's essentially like acetaminophen. Like it's acetaminophen and like a, a thing that kind of help you uh, kill your fever, right? Like that's what that the. The, the analgesic does but like <laughs> the whole point is is like you take that and it's like hey your fever's going and you're knocked out from the antihistamines like it just kills your it, it just makes you so sleepy well night one i took it and i went out night two i took it and i went out and night three i found myself thinking about it a little too much you know what um, I, I was like should i take it should i not take it but i was still coughing so much that i couldn't get to sleep yeah and i was like okay i'm gonna take it to go to sleep and then that was it. But that's an, here's the thing because it's a necessity at that point. Like you yes. need you need it. It's not like it's not it's a it's a necessity, not an accessory. But I was thinking about it a little too much. That that was weird. And it, you have a hangover from it the next day. You feel weird. So because I used to take these cold medicines and like stuff normal people take, like cold medicines, or, or I would drink a Red Bull and be like, this doesn't work at all. But it's like, yeah, bro, look at all the stuff you're on. Like, yeah. How is anything going to break that barrier? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So it, it, it's nice to know those things are there if I need them. So I feel better now. I'm at like 90%. I'm still a little congested. There, I can feel some residual stuff. But Saturday night, I finally felt better. Sunday, I finally got back into my routine. I did my little workout and cleaned the house. I was like, I was like on fire because I could finally function again. But it, oh my god, it was horrible, horrible. Summer cold, brutal. We had, I told you, we had one at the end of June, and it, it, Ellie and I didn't really have that much of a reaction to it. I mean, I was down for like a day and a half or so, but I wasn't really that sick. But Kelly and Evelyn were knocked out, and it was like three, four days. It was really bad. Yeah. So uh, if you live in the New York City area, wash your hands. Yeah. Wear a mask in the subway. Avoid this thing at all costs. I wonder how much that bill for urgent care is going to be. It's impossible to just go to a regular doctor appointment up here. I will confess something. Yes. I have a primary care physician that I have not been to other than to get my physicals done every year for school. I haven't made a sick visit in three or four years because I I just go to urgent care. It's urgent care so much quicker. It's so much easier and it's so much more efficient. Is it more expensive? Uh, mine's $10 when plus whatever the whatever the prescription is. Well, I'll wait until the bill comes and see what the deal is. But yeah, the urgent care was great. I walked in. I, I was in the doctor's office with, within 30 minutes. So Tommy. Yeah, go. What's going on with you? I finished up my first week at school on Friday of last week. That was my first week back. No students yet, but like getting classrooms ready, writing curriculum, writing lessons, kind of teaching new teachers about like what classrooms are like. I got my new car. You got the car. I did. Was it the Jeep vehicle that your stepfather was selling you? Yeah, it's a Subaru Forester. Yes. Yeah, so I I got that. I've been driving it to work since... Does it have air conditioning? It does. It's uh, in it. The day last week that it was 97 outside, I think it was like Thursday or Friday, um, I got in the house and Kelly went to go give me a hug when we first walked in. And she touched my arm and she was like, 
oh my God, you're freezing cold. And I was like, <laughs> it was like not having air conditioning for a while that when I had it, I turned it on the lowest possible setting. Oh my God. And just blasted it in my face. Yeah, it was a great ride home. I generally don't like air conditioning unless it gets above 90 degrees. Yeah. And when I was uh, visiting Tommy, it was a particularly hot day. And I was like, does the air work in your car? And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> it hasn't worked in my car since like two summers ago. I just, I went to go get it fixed and they were like, well, it'll pass inspection, but you don't have any Freon. Le-. And I was like, bro, how much is Freon? He's like, one night. And I'm like, nope. I'm constantly thinking of ways. <laughs> One <laughs> ninety. I think that's what it was to get the air uh, to get the Freon recharge. I think it was. Like it was just, only two hundred dollars. Yeah, and you wouldn't do it. No, I constantly think about ways that I can save money and inconvenience myself, and ruin dress shirts on my way home from work <laughs> while it's a hundred degrees outside. <laughs> oh um, my god. But yeah, no, that's been it. Uh, I've been really nice getting back into the swing of things, getting back to school, seeing old friends and some new, t- you know, new teachers and stuff like that. Girls are doing really well. Everybody's healthy. Everybody's happy. That's about it. How about yourself? Other than the sickness, how are you? I have no complaints. I'm I'm in a good cycle right now. I don't know, just hanging out with friends, having a good time. Nothing weird is going on. No, I don't really have anything to complain about. I'm employed. Podcast is going well. We're on schedule this week. I'm in a good cycle, and I am going to enjoy the heck out of it while it lasts. Yeah, no, dude, everything's been going really well. Things are going great here. Uh, I'm really, really glad. I, I texted you a couple times to check in on you to see how you're doing. And yes. I get nervous when you don't feel well because I know that your state of being affects like how you feel physically affects your mental health a lot and i'm always really nervous when you get sick because i know that you get into a funk and i'm like i have not been it felt like the old days like being high all the time and incapacitated i all i could do was lay in bed and sit there with the computer on watching twitch i hated it i didn't have the energy to do anything it was misery and today I just worked and I didn't put on Twitch at all. I think I'm burned out on Twitch a little bit. I'm taking a little break. Oh, good. I've been actually, uh, I- I've been getting into watching some of the old run throughs of games that I'm not really familiar with. I watched, uh, not the whole thing, but I, I kind of watched a-, a speed run of Doki Doki Panic. Yes. Just, just to see what it's like and see, uh, you know, try to overlay my understanding of mario 2 with that game and see like what is different yeah from what i can see virtually nothing characters i think only the character sprites are different <laughs> yep yeah, what, and maybe the music too i had to watch it with the volume off because i was in i was working <laughs> <laughs> well folks we're out of time so now we're going to talk to new day rising enjoy all right folks we're here now with oliver nachinovich And Adam Brylowski of New Day Rising. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks Thanks for having us. Absolutely. It's great to have you. So, uh, how are we doing today? Oliver, let's start with you. What are you up to? Yeah, I'm on vacation right now. Out west visiting the the in-laws. And uh, uh, there's a birthday party raging upstairs (laughs) right now. So, uh, (laughs) just kind of uh, hit out in the basement right now for the next little while and get this done. So, I apologize if you hear any screaming babies or stuff upstairs and oliver did you have to tell any of your family that you were ducking downstairs to record a podcast i did yeah yeah everyone what was their uh, reaction <laughs> well com- confusion at first um <laughs> uh but uh i mean you know what it, people from saskatchewan are pretty subdued I would, I would have to say so they're like oh okay cool that's that was the reaction i got mostly yeah, that's the reaction I get to mostly when I mention the podcast. It seems to be one of those things that like I actually have asked my wife to stop telling people because <laughs> it's like um I've always kind of like likened it to if people tell them like someone like, "Hey, I'm really into Star Trek." Like one out of 10 people are like, "Fuck yeah, bro. I love Star <laughs> Trek." Which one are you? Is you deep Space? Are you fucking original? Like where are you? Like and then Everybody else is like, oh, 
Okay. <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> they, like they kind of grimace at it and you're like, oh, all right. Or just stop telling people, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the way to go. Uh, Adam, what are you up to? How are you doing today? I'm great, man. Yeah. So I'm actually also on vacation. Me and Ollie are slacking from the band. And uh, I'm at my cottage in Quebec right now. Yeah. Just sitting and enjoying enjoying the rest of what the summer has left, right? Adam, how many how many margaritas are you in right now? Yeah, so I've had just one margarita, but um, I've had a couple beers as well. <laughs> you know, like vacation and day drinking kind of go hand in hand, right? This, that's funny. Both of you guys just happen to be on vacation at the same time. Yeah, yeah. so we kind of actually planned that a little bit because um, with the the stuff that's happening with New Day right now, we're all pretty stoked about it. So we want to minimize the amount of jams that we all miss together you know so let's take it back i want to get to know you guys a little bit before we launch into the exciting news of uh new day rising relaunching so where did you guys grow up oliver give us some of your history first well i was i was born in croatia um former yugoslavia back then so it's I'm dating myself but 1975 uh moved to canada when i was two years old uh, my dad knew that shit was going to hit the fan uh, once the uh, the dictator he was getting he was getting sick and his name was Tito at the time and uh, good thing that uh, we did move because I'm um, you know the war happened in the 90s and uh, I would have been in the army conscripted automatically and fighting against my own people and all that stuff so uh, very thankful that uh, they made that decision I I grew up uh, just outside of uh, Hamilton Ontario where I live now and. Uh, Bounced around after college, lived in Toronto for a while, and uh, you know started a family, and then decided to move back closer to family. Uh, so living in Hamilton right now happily. And tell us about your history with music. Have you always been interested in it? And tell us how you got into punk rock and the more extreme side of music as well. Yeah, so I, I have a I have a pretty creative family. Like my my cousins, my dad's very musical, um, you know, fantastic baritone vocalist. Um, they were very involved in, uh, I guess the, uh, the, the Croatian, uh, culture here. Um, it was pretty big. So, you know, we'd go to these Croatian dances and, and things like that. And uh, they'd have these bands and I would just, I remember just sitting there, uh, at the side stage, just glued to watching the, watching the drummer play. And I just sit there for hours watching. So that was kind of my first real, you know, um, memory of, of being interested in music. And then my cousins who I lived with when we first moved here, um, they're you know, about seven or eight years older than me. Uh, they were, you know, artists and in, into music as well. So they had, you know, the old black Sabbath records. And I still remember, um, looking at the first Metallica album cover and listening to it. And my mind was just blown. So right off the bat, even like I was like five years old, I was like into Sabbath and, and, uh, you know, Metallica, Zeppelin, um, Def Leppard, uh, Kiss, all that kind of stuff. So that kind of set me on that path. And, uh, you know, growing up after that, I was just, you know, I guess when I was in high school and stuff, listening to grunge and uh, a good buddy of mine, a family friend, uh, he was into punk rock. So he he, he, made, he made me a, a cassette tape, which had like Misfits and Seven Seconds on it. Uh, and stuff like that. And, and that just kind of blew my mind. And it was just, you know, the right time, right? I had that, um, you know, 15 year old, you know, male testosterone aggression that was raging through me. Um, so I just, you know, I just connected with it. And, uh, you know, I just kind of kept on with that and started listening to to heavier and heavier music as, as we kind of went through. And in, in college, that's where I met the guys uh, in New Day. So Adam, tell us about some of your history. Yeah, yeah. So I actually grew up in Mississauga, and um, it was just a vast suburban, you know, concrete wasteland. Uh, so I was very happy to move away to Toronto when uh, when I grew up. But when I was in high school, my parents sort of forced me and my brother to take piano lessons, and we were terrible at it. So they, we got kicked out of two different piano schools. <laughs> and they're like, okay, you have to do something musical. So I chose a guitar and he chose the drums. And um, at the time, like kind of similar to Ollie, you know, like Metallica and Pantera were kind of awesome. And I really, really liked that, like super slow, chuggy sound of like Justice for All, Metallica. And, um, and then in high school, I started actually a band with Chris. Me and Chris from New Day started a band that uh, 
kind of got the attention of Dave, who's also in the band as well, Dave Bushmeyer. Um, and then that's where I got introduced to the hardcore scene. I think my favorite or my first show was like a chokehold and grade show um, back when like grade was pretty much me- <laughs> metalcore. Sorry, that's my dog. And uh, <laughs> it just blew my mind, you know, like completely blew my mind. And I felt like I'd found what I was looking for, uh, like in, in the terms of like heavy, chuggy, like awesome, screamy stuff. Yeah. So it was sort of like direct pathway from Metallica to hardcore, I guess. Yeah, so you didn't have any experience with hardcore shows prior to that, Adam? It was just right into a chokehold and grade show in Canada? Pretty much, yeah. So, like, um, the band that I was in before New Day with Chris, we had sort of played a couple local shows with, like, some hardcore-ish bands, but um, that was the first one I remember going to, like, on my own to check it out. And, yeah, it just blew me blew me away. That's amazing. Yeah, grade is just classic. Chokehold, too. So let's talk about the beginning of the band. How did uh, Oliver, how did you and Adam meet? Adam joined the band, I think, a year and a bit in. Right, Adam? Yeah, that's right. After the demo. Yeah. So I met Dave, uh, just to circle back a bit. Um, I met Dave at at art school, uh, Sheridan College in Oakville. And we just kind of, I don't know, sat beside each other and just started shooting the shit and talking about music and stuff. And he said he was you know looking to start a band. I had nothing to do with the hardcore scene at, at all. Zero experience with it. Um, and I mean, I, I was familiar with some of the music and stuff, but uh, no, nothing locally. And uh, so he was like, yeah, I, I know a couple, uh, bunch of guys who, who are playing. So we went over to one night, we just went over to Chris Gray's house um, to meet and jam. And uh, that's how the band started. Uh, we had, who was in that band at the time? It was uh, Jamie Webster was playing bass. Um, Tim Diwelska was uh, on guitar and he was, he was in a band with Dave previous to that, I think called Sunstill Burns. And uh, we put out a demo. Um, but those guys, I think shortly after, um, I think the, the fit wasn't right. So um, we did a lot of kicking out, <laughs> kicking those guys out, um, which was tough, but um, you know, Adam obviously was kind of, you know, friends with everybody um, and it made sense for him to, to join in. And it was, it was pretty seamless. Except I was like a skid. Yeah, hardcore Jesus. He had long hair and a, and a mustache and a, a yeah. weird beard. Yeah, no one had that at the time. It was all shaved heads and big pants and beads and all that stuff. Yeah, I was, I was, I was pushing the envelope hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did it feel coming into this new group, Adam? I mean, it's a it's a new scene for you. I'm I'm sure it's a different type of music that you're writing. It, was it was it a difficult assimilation? Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I mean, like I. You know, I'd played with Chris before, so, uh, you know, I understood the concept of writing music. But when they asked me to play, I think we had a show in two weeks. They're like, you got to learn all these songs in two weeks. And I, it, I didn't know who these guys were at the time, but it was with Bloodlet and 108. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. So that was in, like, I think it was in Syracuse, right? It was like pre-Hellfest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Adam, how was that show? Adam and Oliver, any memories from that show? That's a big show. I don't remember much. You know what? It's, it's funny because like even after all these, these years in, in playing, you know, I don't know how many shows we played, but hundreds of shows or whatever, but it just, everything melds into one show. Right. And you, you kind of, you know, have memories, you know, distinct memories of, of, a, of a few shows. I remember that show, I had problems getting my gear over the border. Um, at the time, I remember they were like super strict. So I had to borrow stuff from the bloodlet drummer. Um, and I just remember like his setup and he was very particular about his setup and I couldn't touch stuff. And I'm left handed. I'm left handed, right? So I had to like move stuff around. And his hi hat was like, you know, a good like foot higher than like how how I play it. So it, it was just like a really awkward. It was an awkward show. I remember that for me, anyways. Um, but it, I had a lot of fun. I remember Bloodlet and like because I'd never heard him before and just standing like watching them at the the front of the stage and it was like red lights, super sinister red lights, and I was again just kind of like blown the fuck away. And like, holy shit, this guy's the devil. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to interject something. This is so funny. And I just I just picked up on it. And I, I kind of was thinking about it. And then I was like, uh, Adam, did you start, describe yourself as a skid? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anybody, <laughs> I actually wanted to ask, you guys are from Canada. And I know that, uh, are you guys familiar with uh, Letter Kenny? Yeah, for oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Is it really popular up there? Yeah, it's pretty big. Okay. All right. So uh, 
anybody that's not familiar with that, I know a lot of our like American listeners are like, what the fuck are they talking about? If you haven't watched that show, Litter Kenny, they kind of introduce three main character types. There's the Hicks, like the farmer kind of kids. There's the jocks, like kind of hockey types. And then there's the skids, which are like kind of think like uh, motorhead fans, like long hair, kind of unkempt, kind of like little rebellious kind of side to them. That show's kind of like um, it's like that's Ontario based, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. It's in Ontario, but it, it plays on like tropes of. Like there's maybe Northern Ontario, there's guys like that, but like out here where I am in Saskatchewan, it's, it's cattle. It's like the real wild West, like that it's, you know, cattle country, um, wheat farmers and stuff. So that letter Kenny is like pretty much being out here in out West and like Alberta, Saskatchewan. Okay. That's crazy. Have you, have you guys seen trailer park boys? Oh yeah. I, no, that's, <laughs> that's what Canada's like. Exactly. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's like one of those things that like uh that came up years ago when we first got Netflix. I remember that came up and it was like recommended. You watched this. Uh, I think it was like you watched It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, therefore, you should watch Trailer Park Boys. And I was like, oh, I'll check it out. And I remember the the thing that made me start howling was the guy who was in charge of the trailer park. What was his name? Leahy. Leahy. Yeah. The guy would just get shit house, like unbelievably drunk. And he had that dude, Randy, that hung out with him. That was like this huge pot belly guy that had like no shirt on all the time. It was the fucking weirdest set of people. Cause like the first one is really introducing like all the characters and they kind of give you the background on like Julian getting out of jail and coming home. And it's like, it's all these kind of like very stereotypical things, but really funny show. Really funny. You know, you know what's funny about that show is that Leahy was like the only professional actor. Every other <laughs> one of those people were like yeah. just dudes that they knew, you know? Dude, oh, get uh, out, really? Yeah. Bubbles, Bubbles, um, he was, uh, he was like, he was a serious musician before that. He was in a band called uh, Sandbox or something like that. Um, it was like a Canadian band that had like a couple big hits on the radio. So it's pretty funny that he like showed up in that show. Okay. So tell us about like building up the band in the early days. Now this is pre internet, right? This is pre boom yeah. of internet. We're doing everything by hand, everything by word of mouth. How did you build yourselves up in Canada? How did you start crawling down to the U S give us a little bit of the background. Um, well, I mean, we were part of a like a really vibrant hardcore scene. Mississauga, Toronto, um, Burlington, Hamilton, kind of like they call it the Gordon Golden Horseshoe, just outside of uh, Lake Ontario on the edge. Super vibrant scene. I mean, you guys know uh, Chokehold, uh, Grade. Um, those are kind of the really big bands that, that kind of came out of there. Um, so we kind of stepped in, you know, into a really vibrant scene. So it wasn't it wasn't too hard. Like, I mean, I, I remember our first show we played, which was super random. We played at like a middle Eastern restaurant on like a Sunday afternoon with grade. And oh, I can't even remember who else was, was there, but I mean, you know, there was like a hundred kids there. It was pretty wild. And, uh, luckily we, we had a really strong scene. There was a, an old, there was a church. Adam, I can't remember the name of the church. It was like Aaron Mills United church. Aaron Mills United church. Yeah. 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 And they had a basement there and they were awesome. Like they let us, you know, put on shows there. And that was kind of like a massive, massive venue for, for hardcore, uh, in that area. Um, and it was packed. Like every time we played there, there was just hundreds of kids. Um, there were some other places in, in, in Hamilton too, like a house for Zach was a, was just like this house, um, that people played shows in. Um, and because, you know, the hardcore scene, it was, it was all ages. Right. So, um, it was kind of hard to do, you know, bigger shows at, at larger licensed venues. So everything was really underground, but, uh, yeah, super vibrant, man. And we had, we had a really strong connection with Buffalo, um, Buffalo hardcore scene there. Um, you know, we had a, we had a kind of a, a brother brotherhood connection with a band called Hourglass, which we did it, we did a split with, um, but, uh, you know, that kind of cross border scene. So their bands would come up here, like bands like Slugfest, um, you know, despair. We did a split with them as well, but, uh, you know, a lot of back and forth and that was kind of our gateway into the States. 
Um, and then, you know, with, with tape trading and, and, you know, you'd go to a, you'd go to a show and there'd just be like tables and tables full of, you know, distros and seven inches and stuff like that. And, and that's kind of how we did it. You know, the old school way is just, you know, tape trading and, and, and buying seven inches. Yeah. And Adam, how did you like this whole scene coming into this new band and everything being new to you? Were you hooked right away? The first time I saw a pretty big hardcore show and I witnessed just the absolute chaos and mayhem, I was hooked. And that was it for me forever. How was your experience? Oh, it was totally the same. Yeah. And, and the, the one thing I actually really liked about the scene, too, is like back in Mississauga and that whole sort of golden horseshoe area that Ollie was talking about. It was super inclusive. And um, the, the thing I really liked about it was like the um, the messaging, too. Everyone was like pro animal rights, you know, like anti racism anti-homophobia, anti-misogyny. So I think that like beyond the music, I just recognized that it was a really, really like good way of spending time. And, uh, you know, like you met good people along the way. So I, I was totally into it. And it was also like new day was kind of doing the, like, you know, pre emo, I don't know what you want to call it, but you know, kind of more emotive hardcore. And I kind of liked that aspect of it too, that, you know, you don't have to be a tough guy to play heavy music. Um, so that's kind of the big things that kept me super interested in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. We, we had, you know, Joanne Sanders was our bass player for, for the first half of, I guess, our life. And she was not into hardcore at all. So, you know, we just brought like this whole different dynamic, I think, to the songwriting process. Uh, we were really open to different genres of music and kind of, you know, coming together and, and doing something really fresh. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because back in the day and even now, I, I would spin the memoirs of cynicism. That was always going around. It was an album I listened to early in my hardcore days. And yeah, it's like first wave of all the all the emo styled hardcore, like the the melodic hardcore that came later, like your hopes falls and your poison the well and all that stuff. This was like before that. This was this is when you hear it, it's almost like the precursor. What what were some of your influences? What were some of the different bands you were into that that fed into that sound? Uh, I'll go first, but um, you know, me coming in into the band, not really being a hardcore kid, um, you know, I, I at the time I was listening to you know Metallica, Megadeth, Faith No More, Primus was a huge one for me. I fucking loved that band so much, um, which is a weird one, but um, you know, it just kind of you know I was coming w with more of more of a mainstream, I guess. Um, kind of feel to it. I think Ministry was like the heaviest thing that I listened to at the time. Ministry and Slayer, um, some of that kind of stuff. And I think Joanne, you know, Joanne was really into kind of like, there's a band out of Hamilton called like Science Spheric, which was, you know, more like shoegazer, psychedelic kind of a feel to it, right? Um, more of like an indie rock kind of feel. So, you know, that was kind of, you know, one half of it. And I don't know, Adam, you can probably speak to the other guys more than me. I know that like Chris and uh, Chris had like a huge breadth of musical tastes and I learned a lot from him, but he, he like got me into the cure and stuff. I remember um, Fugazi was like pretty huge too back then for me because I just thought they were awesome musicians and super innovative. Uh, and, and again, kind of like making intense music that wasn't, um, you know, super aggressive or macho or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I don't, I, I, those other dudes, I'm sure Dave was just straight up into hardcore. He was kind of like, you know, going back to like how the band got a lot of shows and stuff. I think a lot of it was Dave because he was like the networker. He knew dudes like, you know, and again, like pre-internet just through like going to shows and going to fests and whatever. Like he was, he's always been really good at, at, at networking like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think Dave was like, I know he said he has a dag nasty tattoo. Um, but, um, you know, he was, he was kind of really into the local scene, but I know he'd like, you know, bad brains was something he talked about a lot. Dag nasty, um, bunch of local bands too. He was really into like a lot of the, like, you know, the early emo stuff too. I remember there's a band that he really liked Anna Sarka, which is kind of, a, a, was around the same time as we were, um, you know, Fugazi definitely was, was a big one too. So, um, yeah. And Chris, I know he liked sunny day real estate and neurosis was a big one too, that he liked. So there is definitely a, a diverse mix of music that influences us. Yeah, yeah. And you can definitely hear it when you're hearing your music as well. So that makes sense. So how much touring were you doing at the time? 
How old were you when things started getting going? How much touring were you doing? Were you out on the road all the time? So I was, uh, I was in my first year of college. Um, so I was like 19 or 20 when I started. Dave was, I think, a year older than me. And then I think Chris was Chris is three or four years younger. So Dave and I were like the older statesmen. Joanne was actually our age too. So when it when we first started, uh, everyone was pretty much the same age. And then you know we had a couple iterations uh, of the band. When when Adam Adam how old are you? You're a couple years younger than me, right? Yeah. So we um we just played a lot of local shows. Like I mentioned before, we had a you know massively vibrant scene. We played. I feel like we played that church like every weekend almost. It, it was pretty nuts. But I mean the crowds were massive. So you know we didn't really tour too much other than going over to Buffalo. And then we just kind of started branching out and playing like some festivals. Like, you know, we played that Cleveland hardcore fest, the notorious one with the riots. Um, uh, yes. you know, we play some Detroit fest. Yeah. Syracuse fest. Um, so we do like weekend warrior stuff. Cause I mean, we were all in college, you know, uh, you know, Adam and these guys, they were in high school still. Right. So it's not like our parents really let us, you know, take off for, for a long time. So we were pretty young dudes, man. We were, we were young and dumb and, you know, goofy and goofing off and you know just just burning off some energy we did we did one tour though like we did like a i think it was like a um, just like a month down the the eastern like seaboard of the states uh down to like florida maybe the top of florida florida and back and uh that was awesome we got to play with converge uh, oh wow where was that show do you remember yeah, yeah virginia, was, beach. Uh, virginia beach yeah yeah so when you played with them back then were they I got into hardcore and and they were one of the first bands that I saw and already they were pretty big. They were like at the top of the heap. Were they were they at the same level when at the time you played with them? Did they already have that mystique? No, they, this is right when Petitioning the Empty Sky came out. And, uh. and I remember um, like we got that record or we got the CD at the show and we we're playing it for the rest of the tour and we we're like, holy fuck, these guys have like they did it, you know, they're like, yeah. we, what, what are we going to do now? Like, so they, I think that they're like huge, but not like as huge. That's still my favorite album of theirs. That first one. Yeah. Those first two, the first two I heard were petitioning and I got into them when, when forever comes crashing was out. Yeah. So I think those two are still my favorite and yeah, they were, they were headlining shows by then and they just like, everybody was looking for them. Yeah. They were, they were awesome. We played, they came by and played the YMCA in uh, Burlington once. So yeah, they, we got to see them like in a, a gymnasium, like under a basketball net, you know, on that album. And that was pretty, pretty amazing. So you were present for the famous uh, Ohio riot? <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. What did you see? What happened from your perspective? Oh man, we, we had got there. We had got there that day, the day before we were supposed to play. We checked into our hotels and we went to the show. Um, it was packed. It was great. It was awesome vibe there. And I just remember, I'm not sure what happened with, you know, who got on or someone went on, they weren't supposed to go on, but, um, you know, we were just kind of hanging out in the back. Um, and all of a sudden it was just like this stream of people just screaming and people like running back towards the exit. And it was like, I think it was like, a like an armory hall or something like that. So there was like maybe two exits at the back, two, two doors. Um, so we kind of got pushed out and then I, I kind of went back in on the side and, and then I just saw like a bunch of kids just getting their, their asses kicked. Um, it was pretty violent and the, the cops showed up pretty quickly. I remember that and I was standing outside when they showed up and I just remember one cop kind of walking in and he was like, just kind of surveyed the scene and turned around on his, on his CB or whatever and said, I need backup. Um, <laughs> which is pretty funny because there was only, I think there was one cop car there. There's a couple, couple cops. Um, and it, it cleared out pretty, pretty quickly. It, I think it was all done within the hour, but um, you know, you know, in, in those hardcore days, I mean, there's, I don't think it was as bad as everyone, you know, set it out, set out to be, but you know, you don't get a lot of riots at shows. No, I, I feel like it was a more common occurrence in the late nineties, early two thousands. There would always, something would always happen. And it was just like, oh, yeah, this is part of it. I don't see it anymore. Um, can I interject quickly and just say my little story about it? Because uh, oh, please. at the time, I was still kind of work, like rocking my skid hair. And uh, <laughs> I guess I felt like a hippie, right? I was like, yeah, I'm kind of a hippie. And um, 
as like this fight broke out, I was like, I got to get the fuck out of here. I, I was going to leave the, one of those doors and uh, this big Jack dude's like, that's right. Get the fuck out of here. You hippie. And I was like, Jesus Christ, man, what the fuck is going on here? At least you got out of there unscathed though. Yeah. Did. Physically. Yeah. Physically. I think that the next day too, like a bunch of people just packed up and left. Like I know a bunch of distros left a bunch of people who were just like, this is bullshit and just packed up. So we played the next day and it, the crowd was probably like 70% of, of what it was the night before. It was still an awesome show. I was super jacked. I remember like busting like three or four drumsticks that set. Super excited. But I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of show lives in infamy. So you said you toured the East Coast down to Florida. Is that how you got hooked up with eulogy recordings? Oh, man, that's, I think that's a day thing. Um, the tour, I'm not sure how we, we got hooked up with eulogy, but the tour was... Um, it was a pretty interesting tour. Yeah, it was kind of like the East Coast slash Central Central States. I think the furthest we went down was uh, Atlanta. Uh, we played uh, we played that house in Atlanta. Adam, what was that house called? Oh, uh, hardcore house. I don't know, man. Yeah, it was like this like famous hardcore house there. That it was tiny. It was like so hot. It was like ninety degrees in there. I think Dave broke a string, and thank God he did because I was going to pass out and die. That was a crazy tour, man. We had like our, our, our van got like smashed open and we had to like tape it up, tape up the window with like cardboard and we had people autograph it as we like went from state to state and show to show. And then it finally died on us uh, in Philadelphia. We had a couple more shows, I think, in New York City and Boston, which were going to be our biggest shows. We, we just couldn't make it. What do you do in that situation? I mean, you're you're super far from home. I imagine you don't have any money. The van is dead. Like, what do you do? How do you continue? You know what happened? We got, like, taken in by a, a Christian family. And I'm not even joking. Yeah. There's, like, some, some hardcore kid that was like, hey, you know what? You can come. They were at the show. They're like, you can come stay at my place. And their family was there. So the whole band was there for, like, a five days, maybe? Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and there was this... You know, this sort of underlying current of, um, you know, they're, they're super gracious hosts and super nice, but they're like, maybe these guys are here for a reason, you know, like uh, <laughs> so we can spread the gospel type thing. So that, that was a weird ending to the tour, for sure. Yeah, that was super weird because we just decided to pack it up at that point. Um, I think like we, okay, so we had like this, we had like these weird groupies that followed us around on the tour. Don't um, say weird. Well, okay, they weren't weird, but. You know, it was, it was weird for me, I guess, to have a couple girls kind of travel with us in their car. I, I can't remember where they were from, but they drove up to see us somewhere. Um, and then they, they decided to kind of just go with us. Um, and they ended up driving a bunch of us back home. Some of us ended up taking the bus home. Adam, did you take the bus? Yeah, I took the bus. I mean, how does that feel to have women following you on tour? I don't think any woman has ever cared about any band I've ever been in. <laughs> it, it wasn't that they weren't following Oliver and me. They weren't following me and Ollie. Ah, uh, <laughs> I really see. Like, Chris, Chris was a big uh, draw for some women. Uh, so he had some swag. Oh, he had swag, man. Yeah, he had swag. Yeah, you know, he's, he's a handsome man. He's a handsome man. As a fellow member of the band, does that bother you? That would bother me because I'd be like, why him and not me? Why? That's not fair. No, dude, no. You're much more mature than I am. I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I was in a long-term relationship at that time, so it didn't really bother me much. Uh, yeah. I was pretty cool with it. I, I was a skid, so it didn't matter. No one was interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing I seemed to do helped. Like, uh, you know, I started dressing better, I was in bands, and nothing ever seemed to work. Maybe a personality would have helped. How about that? Money, my friend. Money. 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 <laughs> oh, well, the, the, yeah, I'm still working on that one. Well, we'll get there. I remember Adam got mugged in a, the weirdest way. We were in Cleveland or Columbus. We were in Columbus, Ohio. And we're just like walking around before the show, just, you know, checking stuff out. And this homeless fellow uh, came up to Adam and he's like, hey, can I have $5? So Adam's like, yeah, for sure. So, Adam just pulls out his wallet and just like hands him some money. And the guy's like, Oh, he's got more money in there. So he's like, can I have that 20? <laughs> Adam's like, uh, sure. So he gives him a 20. And I'm like, at that point I remember I just pulled Adam's arm. I'm like, okay, let's go, man. Mental notes. Don't pull your wallet out. 
<laughs> yeah, just be like, oh, I don't have any money. Or you know what I do? I'll have I'll have some bills ready to go in my back pocket, and I'll be like, here's what I got. Well, you, I should have brought Canadian Tire money with us. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but we have a store here that used to give out like bills, and and people sometimes would bring it traveling when they got robbed. They're like, here it is. Here's all my Canadian Tire money. Canadian Tire money. Yeah, it's like a massive. It's like kind of like a Home Depot type thing. Oh, uh, uh, okay. In Canada. Actually, it's more like a Walmart, to be honest. It's got like everything other than food, but they have their own money, uh, which you can pay for stuff there, right? Oh, yeah. There's great potential for scamming there with the yeah. money. You could like get a product and maybe return it for cash. Oh, I love it. So uh, let's talk about, okay, so we're touring, right? We're, we're doing good. We're playing in the States. We're playing in Canada. So where does it all lead? Now, we, there, we have an initial breakup sometime in the late 90s, Yes. Yeah, we broke up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Near the end of the band, there was like a whole bunch of lineup changes. Dave left and came back. And then after we recorded Memoirs, I, th- I think ev- everyone just kind of kept on their own, I don't know, just doing their own thing. And and eventually we just sort of faded, I guess. I don't, I, I don't know what yeah, happened. Yeah, I think people just started you know, doing side projects. And, you know, again, we we're pretty young, right? So, you know, our, our tastes were changing. We we're, you know, meeting new people and, and that kind of a thing. So I remember Dave, Dave and Trevor started Carenza, which turned into Spread the Disease, which is a pretty mm-hmm. rad band. Oh, and shit, like, I mean, yeah. We joined, you know, those guys, we're, we're all friends. Like all those guys in, in, in Spread the Disease were all in, in the same scene and stuff. So they kind of started that. And then I don't even know how long Dave was out of the band for. Maybe like half a year, not even, not even half a year. But, um, you know, just tons of side projects. Dave missed the Earth Crisis show. I think he was there, but he didn't. He wasn't playing for the Earth Crisis show in Montreal, right? Unfortunately, you guys knew Spread the Disease. Did you guys know um, that band, The End? Oh yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, yep. Uh, they came down to Philadelphia all the time. <laughs> I, I've I've seen them a, at least a half dozen times. They were crazy good. I used to play with a band with the dude from Andrew Hercules, uh, one of the guitarists. I was in the band before the end with him called Idiowala. And, um, if, I don't know if you can, I don't think, I think there was a demo that, that we put out, but, um, it's crazy music and it kind of shows you where it's more emo than the end. You know, it's not like crazy technical death metal, but you can see like the creativity there as well. The end were like, they were huge fans of Dillinger Escape Plan, as was I. They were my absolute favorite band at the time. And I always had this Dillinger hoodie that I wore and they, they always wanted it. Like they were like, yo, can I, can I buy that? Can I have that? And I was like, no, no. And they were, they were just incredible live, super talented. They were, they were great. I remember when I used to, when we would watch them, I was fascinated with the kid who played bass. Uh, His name was Sean, I think. And I remember watching him play and I was like, I said something like after the show is like, wow, how did you learn how to play so quickly? Like your fingers are so like quick, like that's, it's, how much do you practice and he actually i remember him showing me his hand and he was like well actually my one finger doesn't work on this hand and i was like wait a minute like you have a like you have a like a serious problem with your hand and you're fucking a hundred times better than me jesus fucking <laughs> christ like, what am i doing wrong here he was like no man you just gotta like really like playing and just play a lot and i was like well i don't i never mind <laughs> they're crazy talented those guys yeah and and that was like kind of a a point in the scene where, you know, there was like this big emo thing that kind of, you know, started when we started doing that, you know, even grade, you can see like there's a, the shift in grades music too. They kind of had that, you know, emotive uh, delivery too, but then something happened uh, and it could have been like that convergy type of like metallic hardcore thing started happening. And, you know, that's where the, those guys started, you know, with spread the disease and with Uday rising, that's kind of where they started wanting to do stuff like that. Um, and, and when we recorded memoirs, you know, that was a, it was a massive departure in terms of musical style. So we kind of almost had two lives. We had this kind of like this emo core, you know, the first couple of years was like emo core. And then the, the last half was a you know, really dark metallic hardcore metal kind of a feel to it. Yes. And memoirs of cynicism. I think that's my favorite one. I love it there. Cause like, you know, the, the song will start off really emo, and then it segues right into really brutal breakdowns. That's a great mix. That's right up my alley. Right on. Wait till you hear the new stuff, man. 
Yeah. Oh, yes. Now we're going to get to that too. So, what s- set the stage for us a little bit at the end? Memoirs is out. Do we see a boost in sales? Do we see more people at shows? And I mean, what led to the end? It was that was a weird time because that's kind of like when we we broke up. We had two different bass players play on that album. Actually, we had Adam's friend Mike. He played, I think, four tracks, and then um, Adam played, or sorry, Adam Trevor played on another four. So it was like a really weird time. We ended up like we went down and played like a, a fest in Florida, which was nuts. That was probably one of the best shows. Um, we, we drove down like straight, like Dave's dad drove us. We, we had a van we we drove down to Florida in like, in like one day, it was insane, a day and a half. And we got there super early and then we just waited all day to play. And I think we played at like one in the morning or something like that. And we just went off, I guess it was just like this nervous pent up energy. Um, and we played a, a lot of the new stuff on, on that. Um, and our label was from Florida. Eulogy was, was from that area. So it was kind of like a perfect way to, to kind of launch that album. But I don't, dude, I don't even know what happened. I think, you know what, to be honest, I think um, we got kicked out of our jam space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Dave got into a little bit of an altercation uh, with Chris's dad. Cause we were, we were jamming at Chris's house in his basement. His, his parents were awesome. They just let us, you know, make a lot of racket down there. And then I think just something happened and, and Dave and, you know, Dave, Dave back then was, um, high energy, um, different from how he is now, but, um, you know, he would say he had no filter sometimes. So I think he kind of pissed off Chris's dad. And then we ended up moving to Adam's house to jam. Adam has zero recollection of this, which is pretty funny, but, uh, and, you know, it was just a small space. And, and uh, at that time, like I graduated school, start, guys started going into university and it was just like a transitionary period for us. And we just kind of stopped. Like it wasn't even like an official real breakup. We just kind of just stopped jamming and then faded out into oblivion. Yeah. And I think the last breakup was sometime around 2000. So that's 21 years of inactivity. I have to find out what you guys have been up to that whole time. Let me start with you, Oliver. Were you Man. still active in music? I mean, no. 21 years is a whole lifetime, but give that, us give, give us the big highlights. That is a long time. I think we the official, official breakup was like 99, 98, 99. And then there was some chat about getting back together in 2000, which, which never happened. But um, yeah, like I just, I finished school and, you know, got a job in marketing as a graphic designer and, you know, moved out of the house. I was living in, you know, Toronto in apartments and I just couldn't bring my drums with me. So I literally stopped playing all music, um, up until, man, it was 2000 and 2013, 14. It was a long time. And, um, that was for me, I, I just did nothing. I don't know about you, Adam. Yeah, you know, like I was kind of always trying to do stuff. Uh, After New Day, I played in a band with my brother and Mike Jones, who was on the New Day record as well, who played bass for those four songs on Memoirs. And um, what else? Yeah, just I I was always just jamming, mostly jamming like metal in Toronto with buddies. And um, more recently, I guess six years ago, Ollie and I and Trevor from uh, New Day, we started playing in a band called Pale Drone which was like um, initially supposed to be a New Day reunion thing, but it just didn't end up being that in the end. Uh, So for the past six years, yeah, we've like me, Trevor and Ollie have been playing together, which is kind of awesome because um, it's like got us really in sync with each other. So working on newer New Day stuff kind of feels a little bit more um, just like natural since we've got that chemistry that's been kept alive for the past six years, I guess. Yeah, and Adam, it sounds like you stayed in touch with music after New Day. Did you still, did, were you still into hardcore at all? Did you still go to shows? Were you still kind of in the know about different bands? No, when it comes to hardcore, not at all. No, no, I kind of like drifted off into doom metal and like, you know, like back when ISIS was huge and Cult of Luna um, and that kind of grabbed me a little bit more. So it wasn't up until maybe, actually when pale drone started playing six years ago that i re like found my love for hardcore 
moving on from Doom. I was like, yeah, I've had enough Doom. Let's get back to the hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've drifted in and out of Doom. I I like that Doom. St- I like that kind of Doom stuff. Isis, Cult of Luna. I like. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a. I still have a very big post rock phase. I love emo, straight up emo stuff. I'm all over the map. And Oliver, so you, you know, you got a job working in graphic designing and marketing, and you know, you did, you weren't able to bring your drums with you. Did you think you were ever going to play music again? And did you stay in touch with the music and shows at all? Oh yeah, I mean, music is you know, it's always been a massive part of my life. My wife too. I met my wife, and she's she's pretty massive metalhead too, which was awesome. Um, so we would go to music festivals. We travel for shows, always a massive part of my life still, but for, for playing, I just, I just, I don't know what happened. You know, it's a weird thing. You know, you get kind of sucked into life and other, other priorities and, you know, buying a house and, and all this stuff. And, um, you know, I still kept in contact with Chris, Chris and I have been, you know, pretty good friends throughout this, you know, the hiatus, I guess. He was, um, Chris ended up being in a band with my brother, um, firstly Zion, um, which were incredible. I don't know if you've ever heard Zion, um, but uh, you guys should check them out. It's kind of a really dark, faith no more, hard post-hardcore kind of feel to it. Fantastic. And then that kind of went into the Black Maria. And so using, using that with my brother and with uh, Kyle Bishop from Grade, he was playing guitar in that. And um, they found some success. They, you know, toured and signed a victory and, and did a whole bunch of touring and stuff like that. Um, and that kind of diet fizzled out after, after a while too. And then, you know, it was a, it was a few years uh, in between that. And I, I remember just sitting at a bar <laughs> with, with some of my friends and, and I called up Chris and I'm like, dude, let's get together and jam. Like, what are we doing? You know, like music's our life, you know? So we did like, I think the weekend after that, me and him just kind of went into uh, a jam space, rented like hourly rentals, and we started banging out some tunes that he, you know, he had kind of written already. It was kind of more, I'm not gonna say alt rock, but um, it was a little bit more on the alternative side. And uh, called my brother up, play guitar on that, and that kind of started off really well. We were ready to record, ready to to start playing shows, and then started having kids, got married, like all within a span of like six months. And that just killed everything. And yeah, that totally just, just killed everything. And then a couple of years after that, um, Dave, um, was living in Philadelphia, um, for several years, but, uh, we, you know, we'd all kind of kept in contact with each other, um, on the social media. And he was like floating the around, floating the idea around of, of doing a reunion. And, we're like, yeah, let's, let's try it out. Um, but for some reason, Chris at the time just didn't want to do it. He wasn't ready. Um, didn't feel he could relate to some of the, the, the lyrics and stuff. I mean, he wrote those things when he was like 17 years old. So he just kind of didn't feel comfortable. And I, I don't think he felt he could scream like that after, after 20 years. So we started jamming um, and kind of, you know, hoping he would join, but he just didn't. Um, and then Dave was like, well, you know, I'm not driving up to Phil from Philadelphia to Toronto, um, you know, to do something new. So that kind of died, but the rest of us were like, well, fuck man, this is awesome. Let's just keep going. So that's kind of how Pale Drone happened. And, uh, we, we asked, uh, Connor Lovett Frazier, who was, uh, the lead singer in a, a band called Boys Night Out. We asked him to join and, uh, a friend of mine who I used to work with. Um, to play bass, Jerome, and that just kind of set that off, and we, we've been doing that ever since. Oliver, your trajectory sounds kind of like mine. Th- uh, there's always a large, large gap of time between bands for me, you know, and I think I'm completely done, and I'm like, well, that's it. Uh, my time in music is over, and then something always pops back up. When you weren't doing it, Oliver, did you really miss it? Were you like, oh man, I really want to play again, but I just can't, like it's just not happening, or did you not really think about it? I thought about it a lot, actually. Yeah, you know, I I ended up getting like uh, an electronic kit so I can just kind of play in the house. I lived in like this tight row home um, with with neighbors on both sides connected, so there's no way I could play, you know, acoustic drums in there. Um, so I got the electronic kit just to kind of start messing around. Um, you know, I had some friends who would you know want to play, and we you know rent a studio space and just jam a little bit but it was nothing ever serious. And, you know, my chops kind of disappeared. Right. 
Um, and that's kind of been the hardest part to like, start playing again in your forties, uh, especially drums, like shoulder injuries and like bad backs and shit. Like <laughs> it's not the same, you know, like when you're in your twenties. What's the ramp up time to get back to where you were or close to? it's it's perpetual <laughs> i'm still i'm still not there like it's funny because i look at i watch like some youtube videos of like some of the old shows back back in the day and like i was a fucking maniac like i was so active playing drums and i just there's no way i can do that now so you know even right now when we're jamming some of the old songs again you know i'm kind of i have to psych myself up and really practice um i think i like the last the last jam we had we we um we jammed out one of our old songs and I, I literally sat in the basement and uh, played on my electronic kit for like two hours um, for like three days in a row before we jammed just so I didn't show up and fuck it all up. <laughs> Isn't it amazing the amount of stuff you could do when you were young? I could go out all night, sleep one hour, go to work, work all day, and then go out again the next night. I'm 39 now. And I can't make plans in the afternoon and the night on the same day anymore. Like, that's too tiring for me. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You throw in a couple of kids, too. Like, I had both my kids when I was in my 40s. Oh, wow. Um, it's just, you know, the way the life takes you, right? Like, my wife was in medical school till she was 30. So it didn't make sense for us to have kids right after she just spent, like, you know, it's like 100 grand in tuition fees and, and all that shit. So it's like, well, you know, you need to get working. So we, we, we waited uh, quite some time to have kids. So, you know, it, it's not, it's not easy even right now, just, you know, making time and, and, you know, having the energy, but um, you know, it changes your perspective on things too. It's like, you know, starting to like get back into being physically fit again, you know, being in a band kind of like, you know, having jamming for like two hours and then like my arms just wants, wants to fall off. So you know, it's just like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get in playing shape, you know? So gentlemen, let's talk about the reunion. Now I, I saw you guys randomly pop up on Instagram and I was like, oh my God, they're back. Let's get them on the show right now. Now I want to talk about how did it finally all come together? <laughs> Adam, do you want to talk about the weird Instagram post? Sure, man. Yeah. So, uh, back when, um, like six years ago when we were trying to do the new day reunion thing and we jammed with Dave, he came up from Philly. Um, Chris couldn't make it, but we took a picture and posted it then to Facebook being like, Hey, you know, like, check it out. We're all here playing music. And, uh, maybe like two months ago, um, that came up as a memory for him. So he like re shared it like, Hey, look at this memory. And Chris was like, Hey, you guys didn't ask me to come. What the, what the hell's up? So, um, yeah, we reached out and we're like, yeah, yeah, man, like, come, let's do this. And Dave happened to move back to Toronto like about a year ago. So like all the conditions were right. We're all in the same area now. And um, yeah, it just kind of like happened. And then we all got together and I remember sort of standing there with all our instruments in our hands and it just happened. Like we just started writing music and, you know, it felt kind of really natural. Like, like almost like, like it just never really ended. Like, yeah. and, like very, um, what's the word collaborative approach to writing music, which is what I always appreciated about new day rising. Everyone has their input. So we are all together in the room for the first time in God knows how long. What do you play first? Is there a song that you played first or did you just kind of jam on some new stuff? What happened? We, we just literally like, Hey, who's going to riff? <laughs> <laughs> and and that's how it happened like it, it was it was really just actually it was really bizarre like i think it was i don't know who was adam but adam just like started playing a riff and then we just started building on it and it just we wrote a song our first jam was it weird at all was there any personality quirks to navigate because you know i have i've been in a number of bands i haven't left all of them on good terms so if we were yeah. coming back together i'd be like oh no this guy's gonna do this or oh i have to be careful of that was there was there any uh, choppy waters to navigate? Not at all. No, not at all. Uh, I mean, like w we had spent a lot of time together 20 years ago and that's the weird thing. It's kind of like all of our personalities still work in a certain way together. And, um, you know, we've got like, we've got some great characters in the band. You know, Dave's an uh, awesome dude and a really interesting guy. Uh, but yeah, we're all just friends and, uh, it, it kind of felt just normal which was yeah. maybe the most surprising thing is it didn't feel weird. 
supernatural. I mean, obviously, you know, like Adam mentioned, it helped that myself, Adam and Trevor were, in, you know, in Pale Drone together. So we, we still had that chemistry. Um, and I played with Chris uh, a little while ago, but we still kept in contact. And even with Dave, like Dave's creative output is insane. Like the guy's a phenomenal artist. Uh, you know, he's doing a bunch of musical stuff. Um, he's kind of like this Mike Patton kind of a character where he's just, you know, he has like five musical projects going at the same time. Um, you know, and he's got like a wonderful energy. So when we got back together, we just sat there and it was like, all right, let's go, let's do this. And there was no fear. There was no like apprehension or nervousness. Um, you know, and I kind of felt that like back in the day, um, especially as a drummer, you don't really have a lot of, I didn't have a lot of musical input too much anyways, uh, back then. Uh, but you know, with being in pale drone, I was able to kind of, you know, I had that creative confidence, I guess, to, to help with, you know, the writing and even with rip riffs, like if I had a riff in my head, you know, I don't play uh, guitar or I play very poorly, but not enough to you know present ideas. I'd literally just sit there and like, you know, hum it or mouth it kind of a thing. And the guys are really receptive to it, which is awesome. Right. So normally it'd be like, just, you know, drummer, shut the fuck up kind of a thing. But, but uh, you know, the guys are really receptive to that type of thing. Right. So um, for me anyways, um, I was able to kind of, you know, just flex my creative muscle a bit that way. Um, and, you know, even with, you know, coming in with New Day Rising, it was, you know, I was able to say stuff and like, you know, yeah, I like that. No, I don't. Or try this or, or whatever um, with the guys. And it's just been like super collaborative, which is, it's awesome. It's really refreshing. It sounds like everybody has just always gotten along, which is nice to hear. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely been some bumps in the road. Um, but, I, you know, I think that's all part of it, too, is like we've all been through shit together. And we know each other and we also, we, we're more mature. I mean, at least we're older. So I think everyone's approaching it in a different way. Like not, you know, we've, we've got our own lives. So um, we're, we're like, let's do something great. Let's get back and at the very least just make more music because it's fun as hell to be with these guys. It's inspiring to hear because so decades you guys were not talking or doing different things or involved with different things or maybe trying to put this thing back together. And it just isn't time until it's time. And now you're all back together again. That's exactly what it feels like. Yeah, totally. And I think that like one of the most uh, inspiring things was at the end of that first jam session, when we had like a fully flushed out song, we all just looked around being like, holy shit, we just did that. Um, so it gave us confidence to just, like know that, yeah, this is a, a good thing to do. It's the right decision. We've, I think we've, we're like four songs in. We've been jamming for... I think we've had like five jams, five or six jams so far. Uh, and I think we've, we're, we've cranked out three and a half songs already. That's awesome. So what's the plan? What are, what are we planning to do? A release, some shows? What's, what's the deal? Yes, all the above. Nice. The, the first thing first, we just want to get some songs written, right? We want to feel comfortable with writing songs. But, you know, halfway through a jam, you know, we kind of stop and like, all right, well, let's see if we can revisit some of our old catalog and we're starting with we're starting with memoirs um and it, it's actually pretty funny that we played um old souls first and we fucking nailed that right off the bat which is awesome because that was the first time we played that song in like 23 years and then hired angel was the second one and it was funny for me sitting sitting there behind the drums watching these guys kind of debate and argue what tuning the songs are in, what the riffs are. Cause they you know, literally if I haven't played the song in 23 years. Can't remember anything. <laughs> um, I, Adam, Adam, you can speak to that a little bit better than I can. Oh, you mean, yeah, it was a little tense for a while there. Yeah. We were getting a little, <laughs> <laughs> little snippy, but, you know, it's all good. It all came together. So what tuning is the song in? I'm just asking from like a curiosity standpoint, cause I love that song hired angel. I think that's my favorite. Yeah. We tuned down to D. Like not D open D, but like D uh, D standard. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna do that. I think we're gonna probably there's just, you know obviously some de debate on you know what songs we're gonna play from our catalog. There's songs that like some of us just fucking hate and will we'll never play again. I think chapters is like Dave fucking hates that song. <laughs> He'll never play that song ever again. Um, so I, I think we gotta you know strategically kind of figure out what songs from memoirs to, to play and then, you know, what songs from some of the splits. Um, I think we're probably not going to play as many of the older tunes 
more so I just, you know, we can't really relate to them. And I think even just from, um, you know, liking our music in general, I think we like our older stuff or our, our, our later stuff from memoirs. So, you know, getting those songs down, recording a bunch of stuff, I think we're probably, you know, see if we can do some splits first, just to kind of like get some music out there and, and break the ice and then um, record a full length and, and do some shows locally and, and probably do some like, we'll, we'll probably have to do some mini tours, you know, since, you know, half of us have families and kids and, and you know, full-time careers and all that stuff. So, you know, I, I don't think we'll be doing any like, you know, month long tours or anything like that, but if we could, you know, do like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday tour somewhere, um, I think we're probably open to do doing stuff like that. Be like old man hardcore. Yeah, that's what we do now. No basement shows. That was that was kind of one of our things. I want to play basement <laughs> shows. <laughs> I mean, if if I was in your guys' position and I was coming back to a fairly well known band, I would put my foot down on basement shows. I'm sorry, I just would. I want to play a venue. I'm forty for Christ's sake. I want a tour bus. <laughs> with 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 toilets and uh that's probably not gonna happen but i mean you know we'll, we'll see how it goes yeah i'd still play the basement show who am i kidding i don't have any bargaining chips well guys i'm excited that you're back so all right folks this is what we're gonna do we're gonna find new day rising official on instagram and we're gonna follow them i've been s- s- tracking some updates there and you guys have a band camp up now too with some music yes Yes, Dave put that up. I don't even know what the uh, what the uh, URL is for that, but yes, you can find us on Bandcamp and uh, Facebook as well. Yes, and when you Google it, do New Day Rising Band, or you'll get assailed with uh, images of the Husker Du album. Yeah, yeah. There's also <laughs> like some random New Day Rising bands. Oh, uh, I didn't want to bring that up, but I yeah. was like, all right. Weird Christian rock band or something? Yeah, they're like a little bit heavier, but like I played it for Keith. I was like, this isn't them, right? Like this, they didn't like complete. And he's like, oh my God, what is that? And I was like, that's New Day Rising on YouTube. I mean, like, because you guys can find your record and then a couple clips from uh, WB Fest that you played up in Wilkes-Barre. Um, and, and then the rest of it is uh, this other band. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think they're around anymore, but, um, they're them. And there's also like this, there's actually a, a hardcore band in Brazil called New Day Rising. I don't think they're around anymore either, but. Oh, wait, Oliver, uh, were you the one that said you worked randomly with the dude from Cryptopsy? Yes. One of uh, the original bass player. Uh, I think he was on their demo, uh, which was like super random when he first started working with me, we just, you know, started talking about music. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I was in this band. You probably never heard of it called Cryptopsy. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> Hell yeah. Tommy, that's like, that's a Tommy band. Tommy's really into the more metallic stuff. I, I hear Cryptopsy and I just automatically think Tommy. They just were, they had, uh, I don't know, if, did Relapse put that out? There was like a little uh, thing that Relapse had put out and they had put the track, I think it's track two from Whisper Supremacy. It's called Cold Hate, Warm Blood. And it starts out with that classical guitar part and then goes right into this like really great blast. Uh, but I I am fascinated with people that can play drums incredibly fast like when i when i start uh, when i search on youtube and i see people doing like hey check out this blast at three t you know 310 bpm i'm like really like how like that's the fucking in most it's like this it's like an arms race but who can play faster <laughs> and i i it's 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 just fascinating to me because it's like you know sometimes you'll watch the other people in the band and you're like well, everybody else is kind of mediocre, but the drummer is phenomenal. <laughs> this is, like this guy might be in eight bands and none of them are really great, but he's the best player out of every single one of them. My new favorite thing, and I've been trying to turn all the guests onto this. There's a band out there called Ulcerate. And it's like lots of bands have like a lead singer or a lead guitar player. I feel like Ulcerate is the first band that has a lead drummer. <laughs> he is just so fucking good <laughs> he's just so good and I, i'll watch all the drum cam videos of him and i'm just it's just fascinating to see someone play that well yeah man that's like, like a really cool thing now with with like drum cams and youtube and all that shit is you can just watch your favorite players right just from a different perspective other than like you know from the pit or you know from, yeah. from the stands or whatever it's awesome 
And it's really cool. So people have gotten a, like, you know what? All right, we're not just going to play the track over top of it while they're playing. Like, they'll use the real mix and they'll bring the drums up so you can really hear what they're actually playing. Really, really cool stuff that going on. I, I love that shit. I was just going to interject and say that the craziest thing about those drummers is when I watch them, it looks like they're not even breaking a sweat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're just kind of like lightly like tapping the cymbals, but it's just like the most insane blast beat that's coming out. It's amazing, man. Totally. I have a question for you guys. So you broke up before the internet was even really the internet. I think there was only AOL. Did you have people contacting you over the years and saying like, oh, I really like the band? And did you see videos pop up on YouTube and stuff? And how did that feel? Yeah. So there, I mean, yeah, before everything was like, you know, camcorder, right? And it was kind of like quiet for a little while. And then, you know, on YouTube, I think people just started like, you know, dusting off their old camcorders and finding shit in the attic and just started uploading stuff. And then with, you know, with social media, being what it is, I think that was kind of where, you know, all everything started happening. I mean, you guys are familiar with, there's like Instagram pages, which are just dedicated to like nineties hardcore. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Right. And there's, that was really when we started seeing it, right. We started seeing just people like, you know, messaging us. I think we started our Facebook page like quite some time ago, you know, people are just like, Hey, are you guys going to ever you know do a reunion? I think that was the biggest question we read. We would get like quite often actually over the years, you know, we're just, you know, no, it's not happening or whatever, but, um, it's just like, there's just a weird, you know, groundswell of like this interest. I don't know if it's like guys, like we're all in our midlife crisis now and just reminiscing about, you know, back in the day, but, uh, massive nineties, you know, upswell of interest. I think that's it. I think enough time went by and we dusted off all of our stuff and, you know, we, we have some time to post it up. That's how our page started too, as one of those, uh, localized scene memoir things, and now the podcast is kind of the focus. That's awesome, man. The one thing I want to say is that Chris actually has been um, going through all his old like VHS tapes from our shows, and uh, he, he's put up a YouTube channel. I think there's like maybe five old New Day shows on there, and some they're pretty bad quality, but that that was also kind of awesome. Just as we started doing this, Chris was like, check out all this old stuff. So yeah, like it's, if you're interested in the music and the band, then you'd probably want to go check that out. We have actually some releases coming out, um, some re-releases. So memoirs of cynicism is going to be re, uh, re-released. Well, released for the first time on vinyl. So that's happening through, I'm going to fuck this up. Protagonist. So that's the dude from groundwork. He's, he's putting out Brendan. I think that's his label. So he's going to be putting that out. So I'm just working on the artwork right now for that. I think that's going to be coming out next year. Our demo is being released on on vinyl as well, 12-inch, through, I think, Wrecking Crew Records out of Montreal. So that's happening. Um, I'm working on the artwork for that as well. So uh, just kind of keep your eye out for that. Um, they're probably going to be smaller runs, obviously, but you know, I'm sure they'll be repressing if, if they sell out. Excellent. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of stuff coming up. I'm excited. That sounds awesome. Well, uh, gentlemen, Oliver, Adam, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your vacation to speak with us. It was it was really awesome talking to you, and I'm definitely looking forward to more from the band. Thanks so much, man. It's been an awesome time. Yeah, super fun. There you have it, folks. New Day Rising. They were an absolute pleasure to talk to. That was a really fun conversation. That's really great. Is like they were. I think of that band, and I think about like how big I thought they were at the time, and they're like, "Yeah, we didn't really tour that much. <laughs> we didn't really play." I'm like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> yeah, they weren't like they weren't like Poison the Well huge. They they were known. They were known for yeah, sure. Yeah, but like they weren't huge huge. But it's that's exciting that they're back. Twenty one years. That's a that's a really long hiatus. Actually, twenty two years because they said I was counting from two thousand, so it's ninety nine. Yeah, they said ninety nine. They stopped. I was counting that attempted get back together in two thousand, but I guess that didn't happen. I'm really glad, and this is my key takeaway that the slang from Letter Kenny actually holds up. <laughs> yeah, he said. What did he say he was? A skid. 
Yeah, when he said I was a skid, I, I kind of laughed and I was like, I have no idea what that is. But then you mentioned that show. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, uh, skids are like the kind of like... Like the metalheads. L- long-haired, trashy dude. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Think like Trans Am and fucking Marlboro Reds. Yeah. He would be like the uh, the Judd... Who's the guy from uh, Breakfast Club? Judd, he's the Judd, Judd N- Nelson, Nelson from yeah. Breakfast Club. Yes, yeah. that's a skid. That's yes. skids. Yep. Now I understand. See, Tommy, that's why we're the perfect match for this show, because <laughs> you come in and answer all the questions of things I have no idea about. <laughs> it's also... My, like Canadian television. I was going to say, my, my extensive knowledge of Canadian television, which amounts to about three television shows, apparently. <laughs> yeah, there's that show and uh, Degrassi and, and... Trailer Park Boys. So Trailer Park Boys is a Canadian show. Yeah, yeah. That's... Uh, e- it's one of those things you pick up on when you're like, when you watch the show, like in succession, like you'll see things like when they handle money, you're like, Oh, okay. Or like when they, you know, they don't say like, you know, like they go to the liquor store and like they buy things and they talk about things in terms of like milliliters and liters. And you're like, wait, what? And they say, sorry, sorry. I'm I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) My memory, my memory of that show is permanently tied to, the summer before I moved, I was like hanging out with this girl and we just sat in her house and I got really high, dangerously high, and I would watch that show on her laptop. It's pretty, it's it's a great show. The only one, there's a dude on there and I actually, I remember watching it the first couple times and I, it, he's the guy who plays J-Rock. He looks alarmingly like a young Bill Burr. Uh, it's like next time you watch that show, it's the kid who like does like, he dresses like real gangsta. He always has like a Jersey on and like a sideways hat and shit like that. And he always, gets, Oh, I'll never watch it again. Oh, okay. Well, he gets, yeah. Oh, yeah. It did not stick with me. <laughs> <laughs> this did not resonate with me. Yeah. I guess, I guess I liked it at the time. Okay. But it wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to continue watching this on my own. You know, I've come full circle with, uh, I used to think South Park was hilarious when I was like, whenever it first came out and it was like, Oh, they say swear words in their cartoons. And then I just stopped watching it for a long time. And in the last, like, uh, I guess two weeks or so, I've started watching a few more episodes. Wow. That show is fucking really good. <laughs> like It's politically like right down the center. Like they don't pander to one, like, you know, political party or the other. And they just fucking slam everybody. They make fun of everybody and everything. It's really, really well done. Yeah. That's another one. I just, well, I liked it before. I just, I, I would just never watch it again. I don't know. I don't watch anything though, so I'm, I'm no good judge. But you watch Twitch. Well, yeah. Now I have some big Twitch news, Tommy. Oh Lord, this is going to be very nerdy, but I'm good. I'm. This is what I do. So you have to listen. I mean, this is my podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> so you know Arcus, the cowboy speedrunner. Of course, I signed up for Twitch just to watch him. Like, he's the channel I watch the most. Now, he's been grinding Ninja Gaiden 2 for NES full-time since January. So that's 40 hours of Ninja Gaiden 2 a week, Monday through Friday, 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. And I watch this. I watch this every night. And you know what? I never get bored. It's it's hypnotizing. He's He truly is the Bob Ross of speedrunners. Now... He's been grinding to get a sub-10 in Ninja Gaiden 2, which means beat the game in less than 10 minutes. And he finally got it last week. Wow. Yeah. And I got to see it live. I was editing the podcast, and I, all I hear is him say, I'm getting really nervous. I'm getting really nervous. So I like lower my laptop to look at the big screen yeah. where I have the stream up. And he did it. It was really exciting. Well, we have we got into uh, talking about what were we talking about last week? Was it last week or the week before that? We started talking about like video games, and I was like, I always feel bad when we talk about video games. I don't know a lot about video games. Like you I, do though, but and you started asking me questions, and you're like, you know, ninety percent more than most people. Yeah, <laughs> like All yeah, right, fair. You do, you do. When my schedule changed this year, I had a lot more free time. So that's how I got into Twitch. I'm like, well, what am I going to do on that? Okay, I'll watch this. So watching, I don't know, it, it was just weird. Like watching this every night and then him finally hitting the goal. 
And that night he switched to a new game. I was like, wow, that was quick. I don't know if I'm ready yet. <laughs> oh, so like he was like, I got what I wanted from this one. I'm out. I'm on to something new. Yes, just like that. What's the new game? It's a run of different NES games. To He does what he calls the Arcathlon. Well, he'll run like 10 different NES games in a row. Oh. Yeah, so like Mario 1, 2, 3, Zelda 1, 2, Castlevania. He'll do them all in one sitting. Jesus. It's incredible. That is an incredible skill, though. Like, there's got to be... I wonder what other applications you could have for that like video games are phenomenal and it's great that he's i'm sure he's making a very good living off of twitch he does that's all he does but he has over two thousand subscribers at his best so two thousand subscribers there's tier one two three subscriptions lowest is five dollars so if you're even getting half of that money that's good so are there advertisements on his page like does he sell advertising space too uh i don't think it works like that if you subscribe, you get to skip the advertisements. So listen, I want to cover some show news as well. We have to check in with our faithful audience. Now, here's what we need. We need more followers on Twitter. Follow us at the NE Scene. We need more followers on Instagram. Follow us at the NE Scene. And remember, members are supporters of the show. You're a member when you say you are. So if you want to be a member, you're a member. Post an Instagram story and tag us and say, I'm a member of the Northeast scene. Yeah, free of charge. No no cost. We don't ask anything. and Everyone is included. This is not an elitist group here. We need more Apple podcast reviews. We haven't gotten one in a while. Apparently, they help out in the world of podcasting. Give us a five-star review and write a nice little review, and we'll read it on the air. Those are fun, and it helps us out. These are These are little ways that you can help support the show, because... We don't do a Patreon or charge for episodes or anything like that. So uh, these little things help. Oh, another big one. Find us on YouTube, The Northeast Scene. All the podcast episodes are there, and I post random demos and show videos sometimes. So subscribe to that and like the videos and comment on them because that all helps feed into the YouTube algorithm. So a little bit goes a long way there. Last but not least, our Spotify playlist. I do a new one for each year. So look for the Northeast Scene 2020 or the Northeast Scene 2021. We put all of our guests on the podcast. We put all of our guests on the playlist, as long as they're on Spotify. And all the random bands that we like, or maybe bands that people mention, you know, if it's if it piques our interest, it ends up on the playlist. Like, Tommy, you 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 shoot me bands sometimes, and I'll, I'll throw those on there. It's a, it's a nice way to go in and hear all the music in one spot that we mentioned on the show. Can we talk about Mall Walker? Yes. Holy fuck, is that band good? Check out. Uh, I'm gonna put them on the. I'm gonna put them on the playlist. Corey from Glassing posted about them, and it's 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 that exact stuff that I love, like that Castavet Midwest sounding emo, like lively type music i love it i absolutely love it yeah it's and it's um it's short it's like a four song ep it is and every song is really really good like we have to get them on they're so fucking good the guitar parts are catchy but at the same time um you know what they do that i really love and i don't hear a ton of bands doing this now they have that hot water music vibe where like the vocalist has that kind of gravelly but singy voice at the same time. There's not many people out there that do that. There's people out there that do that. There's not many out there that do that well. Yeah, my my thing is like I hear that band and I'm like, I could play this. I want to be in this band. I should be in this band. Oh, I couldn't. That first song has a really there was a couple riffs in there that are fucking hard. <laughs> Oh <laughs> man, there's they're really hard parts. There's that one thing; it's just like a straight run. It's like, and it's like nope. yeah, I can't do that stuff. But when they were like, bah, 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 I'm like, I can do that. That's my riff, <laughs> <laughs> right up my alley. Let's go. Yeah, um, but uh, there. Oh, it's it's that's my uh, that's my EP of the summer. Now it's really I was listening to that uh, a lot yesterday. And Keith ruined my Friday night. If I can mention that. What I do? Yeah, I, I fucking watched one of your movie recommendations, which was Midsummer. Oh my god! I didn't have any kids at my house. Uh, my 
father-in-law was receiving his last uh, treatment for cancer on Friday afternoon. So my my wife and kids went up to go uh, surprise him out in the parking lot. And so he, when he came out, he was like, Hey, I see everybody. That's great. I'm done. And now let's go get pizza. Um, well I had the house to myself. So I was like, I'm going to watch a movie that I can't watch when the kids are home. And I was like, I want to watch like a horror movie. So Keith told me that this movie was really scary and he wasn't wrong. (laughs) It is not even scary as much as it's fucking disturbing, like really fucking disturbing. (laughs) That is the most disturbing movie I've watched, I would say, since the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, yeah, it ranks right up there with, you remember when you, uh, this is what got me with the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That first section when um, the guy goes behind that metal door and yes. Leatherface slams him in the head with that uh, the meat tenderizer and then he leans over and slams the door shut. In my head, I, I remember saying to myself like, Oh, there's no hope. There's nothing left. You can't, you you are all, if you're behind that door, that's where you die. Like this is, you can't escape from this. Like this, yeah. like uh, I got the same feeling. There's a, a scene early on in Midsummer where they, you know, it's a, should we even go over the plot? No. It's, right? it's, it's pretty old at this point. So if you okay. haven't seen it and you don't want it spoiled, Fast forward. Yeah, uh, but uh, these people, uh, what kid's going to do his thesis on this uh, group of people that live out in the, essentially what amounts to a collective. Uh, Sweden, right? Is that what it is? Yes. Yeah, and um, they have some very strange rituals that go along with it, but one of the first things that they uh, really encounter is these two older people, this is part of their kind of uh, ceremony, uh, jump off of a cliff. Um, onto a, a series of jagged rocks below um, to kind of like, you know, say like, this is my final, like my swan song. This is what I'm doing as my last act as a human. Uh, but uh, they show it. Like you see the people f- like fall the fuck apart. <laughs> like, And then the one guy lives and they walk over with this giant fucking hammer and just smash his face in. Not once, oh my God. but multiple times. It is fucking horrific. <laughs> I forgot about that. I couldn't sleep for three or four nights after I watched that. If you don't want to watch the whole movie, just just do Midsummer horrible deaths or Midsummer uh, death sequences. They put somebody's put all of them on YouTube. They are unbelievable, <laughs> like, really fucking terrible shit. But I I was like literally I put the uh, I I don't have it I don't have it on DVD. So obviously I was watching it on my laptop and I'm sitting in my house by myself. Thank God the dog was with us. Like I'm sitting there on the bed and I'm like, OK, it's time to go to bed. I uh OK. Uh, all right, dogs here. I like held the dog while I was going to bed. <laughs> I couldn't, I, there was no way I was going to sleep without having some type of like comfort and security in the real world of like, cause my brain is just replaying the horrific parts from this movie over and over again. It was uh, uh, unbelievable, but, um, I wouldn't watch it again, but here's my thing. Don't regret watching it. No, I'm glad I watched it. I wouldn't watch it again because I don't think I could handle it. I, I've realized that, uh, I'm pretty squeamish these days, and yeah. I, I don't know, a lot of things disturb me, so I, I just like to watch nice stuff most of the time. But I'm glad I watched it, because I would say it is the best horror thriller type movie I've seen in a very, very long time. Tommy, if you ever want to torture yourself again, same director, uh, the movie before he, Midsommar was Hereditary. It, it, is it about a Korean family? No. You're thinking of Parasite. Parasite, Okay. Parasite okay. was excellent too, but Hereditary is equally as disturbing, possibly more disturbing. Okay, yeah, I'll have to wait until the kids go away again. <laughs> yeah, give yourself some time because if you watch those back to back, you're going to have to check into an institution of some sort. <laughs> I will say this: I can go back and rewatch um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. When I had strep throat two years ago, I remember I laid in the basement bed because I don't want to get anybody else sick, and I I watched it twice in a row. And I was like, I was, this I can watch this movie over, and it it it, it was it, it was just as satisfying the second time. I watch clips on YouTube, and it's still just as terrifying because it's like it looks old. It looks like found footage. It's just 
It's terrifying. Oh, that's a great movie. It's a really great movie. And my my favorite part still is is like when I uh when I f- I don't remember the first time I watched it, but I remember the first part of that movie that really kind of like made me squeamish and kind of like gave my stomach that weird feeling is when they pick up that hitchhiker and he just takes that straight razor and cuts his hand wide open. <laughs> Look at the blood. <laughs> like, holy shit. <laughs> That's how you know things are. Uh, and he marks the van as it's driving yes. away. Yes. Oh, God. That movie's great. Well, folks, sadly, we're out of time. We must leave you until next week. But uh, I had a lot of fun. How about you, Tommy? This was a great time, and I, I'm really glad we're getting bands on, like uh, the bands that we really kind of made us fall in love with hardcore in the 90s. Like that's, that's great to see bands like that not only coming on here, but reuniting and making new music. That's, I'm so fucking hyped for them. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to get to talk to them because, you know, they were just CDs that I listened to decades ago, and I'm glad they're back and doing new stuff. I'm excited to hear it, and... We're back next week with another new guest. I'm going to tease you, audience. I'm going to tease you and say that we've got another new guest next week, and you're going to like it. So uh, that's it. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and until next time. Yeah!